يا اخوان عايزين نشغل سينما الثوره ودي حارتكم ودي سينمتكم هل امه هل امه هذا فيلمكم الذي اخترتوه عشان ما بعد فيكم يجي يقول لها فيلم كعب <تصفيق> was from the documentary Talking About Trees, a film about the demise of Sudanese cinema and a group of retired directors hoping to revive their country's love of film. It premiered at the Berlin Film Festival and is out in France later this month. The director, Suab Ghazmalbari, joins us in the studio for this week's film show with our critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello. Hello. Hello, Lisa. Hello. Now, Suab, start by explaining to our audience why there are no cinemas in Sudan. Uh, there is no cinema in Sudan for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, it was because of the coup d'etat uh, that brought Omar al-Bashir to power. Uh, the next day uh, after the coup d'etat, um, curfew was imposed on the cinemas uh, in Sudan. And uh, as the cinemas are open-air cinemas, so they died uh, from the second day, actually. Just before the coup d'etat, uh, cinema used to be very popular, even more popular than football. Um, and this just uh, ended in one night. And Lisa, Talking About Trees is a film that speaks to all of us about what cinema means to us, um, about the beauty of seeing a film with an audience. Well, that's so much better than looking at it on a mobile phone or an iPad. Now, this is a subject very close to your heart, I know that. Um, what did you think of the film? Well, I truly believe that after food, shelter and clean drinking water, everybody everywhere should have access to books and to the communal delight of watching a movie together in a theater setting. So I had my fingers crossed uh, that this uh, abandoned outdoor cinema called The Revolution would in fact reopen. Now you shot the film yourself, and I love the way you eavesdrop on these four uh, surprisingly <laughs> cheerful guys, friends, as they try to replace dirt and dust with a little bit of fairy dust. Okay, well let's take a look at a moment from Talking About Trees. <laughs> يا حلالك فؤاد ملكوه وغيرك فؤاد ملكوه وغيرك قد يجي تلاعب يعني. وزنه كثير وغالي جدا جدا واخد معاك البتاع ده عالم الاكياس now, the directors in your film, none of whom have been able, sadly, to make a movie for a long time, studied filmmaking in Germany, in Egypt, all the way in Russia. Your film is a co-production among France, Sudan, Germany, Chad, and Qatar. And in the film, we see an audience watching Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times from 1936, and they're laughing and enjoying themselves 80 years after it was made. Would you say cinema is truly a universal language? Yes, of course. Uh, cinema and arts and uh, literature and they're universal. And this is what I hope for my film also to be universal. Because it, it, it starts with these guys uh, imitating a scene from Sunset Boulevard, which is one of my favorite movies. It's not an African film, but it belongs to everybody. Now, in Saudi Arabia, in the past 18 months, movie theaters have opened again after being closed for more than 35 years. Over two-thirds of the population of 22 million people is under age 30. So like the eager young man in your film who say they'd go every day if the theater was open, they have never seen a movie at the cinema. Why are dictators and Islamists so afraid of the power of film? Well, me neither. I didn't see uh, a movie when I was uh, young in Sudan, actually. I just started going to cinema after I left Sudan. Um, I think um, the, the power in Sudan had uh, a project uh, uh, to delete totally all the, the, the visual memory of uh, the Sudanese people and to replace it with the propaganda images that they were producing. Uh, so uh, it was clear that, uh, uh, the reason is clear actually, that they didn't want cinema because it opened the, the minds. Now the film was actually made in secret, wasn't it? Um, before the Sudanese revolution, um, which resulted in President Omar al-Bashir being overthrown earlier this year. Are you feeling more hopeful now about the future of film in Sudan? And are um, the four gentlemen in the film feeling more hopeful about reopening um, the revolution? Yes, we are all um, 
very hopeful, but uh, carefully hopeful because uh, Sudan now uh, has a lot of other priorities also. Uh, there is uh, Sudan needs uh, transitional justice. Uh, Sudan needs to, the economy to be saved, uh, the agriculture, uh, the education and healthcare. Um, actually, the, the regime of Amr al-Bashir gave us a, a totally destroyed economy. So uh, there is a lot of other priorities. What uh, my hope for cinema now is to to have uh, real liberties in Sudan, um, liberties that are not conditions conditioned by the relations to the power or anything. That, that they just let us uh, make films and show films to the people. Uh, for the cinema revolution, yes, uh, we are trying to reopen it. Uh, the the owner agreed to let us uh, screen talking about trees uh, in the cinema. So it will be a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> now, because of movies and TV, just about everybody has an image in their head of what the United States is like or what France is like. Uh, but most of us don't have a mental image of what Sudan is like, and it's a country of 35 million people. So can you tell us, um, if we'd had all these years of filmmaking, what would we think of when we think of Sudan? Uh, you will be seeing a lot of very rich uh, uh, stories and uh, and paysage and uh, uh, locations. Uh, I think, um, sadly, f for my generation, even we didn't uh, know about the films of these four uh, magnificent uh, filmmakers. When I discovered their films, I was really sad that we were prevented from seeing them earlier because they are they are very uh, demanding uh, artistically and uh, intellectually pieces of art. Um, so uh, what I would love now that the, that the world can see their films, their films were restored um, and now they are available uh, through the Arsenal. It's an institute in Germany uh, and they are uh, starting to be screened in uh, some festivals. And yes, for, for me, their films, they are the best uh, of Sudanese cinema. Well, so we're going to move on to another beautiful film now. Um, do you follow at all Terence Malick's work? Yeah, of course. Have you managed Everyone. to see his um, his new film, A Hidden Life, because that has been on the, f the festival circuit. Have you had a chance to see it? No, I didn't, but I will go to the cinema, of course. Okay, well, he's going to tell us about it. It's a portrait of Austrian um, conscientious objector Franz Jägerstatter. Tell us about the film. Well, Jäger Stadter was an Austrian peasant who served in the army and returned from war, convinced that he simply couldn't swear allegiance to Hitler when asked to serve again. He had a lot to lose, a pastoral life he loved, a wonderful marriage, lovely daughters, uh, the respect of his neighbors in his village. But having taken the time to examine what his Christian faith presented as the way to lead a meaningful life, he decided he simply couldn't pretend to go along with Hitler and the Nazis. He was branded a traitor, arrested, tortured, and executed by the Nazis in 1943. Now, the Nazis hated Jews, but they also had it in for many Christians, and Jagerstadter was beatified by the Pope in 2007, something his daughters did live to see. They also got to see Terence Malick's movie, which premiered in competition at Cannes this past May. Okay, well, the images are absolutely mesmerizing. Let's take a look at a clip of the central couple's loving complicity. short moment there but the film is actually nearly three hours isn't it it is but it doesn't feel that long because Malik takes the time to build a tale of convictions and personal loss in the service of a higher ideal and while it's anything but a typical action movie it is quietly kind of thrilling Malik's camera establishes how fulfilling life can be the better to explore what sacrificing that life might mean. We feel as if we could smell the grass or the fragrant harvest, the sun on our skin, the simple touch of a loved one. 
And Franz is a soldier who actually served and then decided to become a conscientious Exactly. Executive. So his convictions demand our respect. They stem not from some lofty theory, but from lived experience and genuine faith. Now, Hitler and the Nazi ideology, of course, demand blind obedience, and for the most part, they get it. Franz isn't going to dent it by opposing it. His protests are inconsequential. His sacrifice will not make the Nazis' apparatus or reconsider their change their path one iota. He refuses to hail Hitler, and that will mean the end of his life, a life infused with love. Okay, truly beautiful film, that one. Now, we're going to end with another film based on a genuine historical character. Tell us about Fellini's Casanova that's been restored and is out this week. Well, Federico Fellini cast Canadian Doug, uh, Donald Sutherland as Giacomo Casanova, the very prolific Latin lover whose name has become synonymous with having one's way with the ladies, which is not bad for somebody who did his wooing and seducing back in the 18th century when pregnancy and the possibility of mm, venereal disease loomed large, as did the fact that dry cleaning had not yet been invented for all those layers of fan fancy clothing. Of course, Casanova was his own best publicist. I'm told he doesn't appear in contemporaneous history books. We know of him primarily because he wrote his own lengthy memoirs. His life truly was one of adventure. Fellini's then outrageously costly vision involved hundreds of extras chosen, as you can see, for their unusual distinctive faces. Let it be said that when you are watching a Fellini movie, especially one from the 1970s, the spurt fist hurt first hit theaters in 1977, uh, you, you know you're in the presence of Fellini. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much. Now we're going to leave you with Fellini's Casanova. Swab, do you have a favourite Fellini film? Uh, from Fellini, my favourite is Amar Court. Yeah, I cry every time I, I see it. I love and cry. <laughs> Swab, Gaz Melbari, thank you so much for joining us. Your film, Talking About Trees, is out later this month in France. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.